Our first scripture reading today comes from Revelations chapter 1, verses 4 to 8, and it can be found on pages 994 and 995 in your pew Bible. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Well, our second reading today is from the Gospel according to St. John. And this is the passage that I'm going to be looking at in the sermon today, beginning in verse 19 of chapter 20. Jesus here appears to his disciples after he's died and rose again. Beginning in verse 19, When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I won't believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Well, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. Oh God, we, we thank you again for this holy season of Easter, and this chance to begin our week by celebrating your grace, by worshiping you. We thank you that, that this gives us the opportunity to experience you in new ways. We pray that you'd fill our hearts and our lives with your grace today as we reach out to you. Give us wisdom. Guide us as we humbly come before your word. Be with us, we pray, both here and as we leave, to share your love with the world, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the children 
were lined up in the cafeteria of a Catholic elementary school for lunch. At the beginning of the lunch line was a huge pile of apples. The teacher had placed a sign on it earlier that read, Take only one. God is watching. At the other end of the lunch line, there was a huge pile of fresh chocolate chip cookies. And there, a child had posted another sign, Take all you want. God is watching the apples. <laughs> now, Scripture, of course, teaches us that God is everywhere and sees everything, uh, including what's going on uh, with the cookie pile. Uh, as Jesus put it in our reading from the book of Revelation today, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. In the ancient Greek language, Alpha is the first letter of the 24-letter alphabet, and Omega is the last. And since language is one of the primary ways that we use to describe the world around us, to describe reality, by calling himself the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, what Jesus is saying is that there's no place in our reality, yesterday, today, or tomorrow, where he is absent. He's there in every situation, working for our eternal good. Even in those moments when we, despite our best efforts, feel we've failed in some way. Most of us have experienced failure at some point in life. Most folks do. But if we embrace Christ's presence, that is right there in the thick of it with us. Christ will always show us how to move beyond it. And one of the ways that Christ will help us on some occasions to do that is by showing us that what we thought was failure was actually a great success. God's perspective is so much greater than our own. And many times when we feel we failed, we haven't. And this, I believe, is one of the primary messages that our gospel reading today teaches us when we study it in the context in which it was originally written. You know, so many times individual Bible passages are are taken out of context. And I've mentioned before how important it is to understand them all in the context in which they were originally written. The cultural, the political, and, and the literary, the geographical context. Because that's how we can understand what they really mean. That's why I talk so much about all this Greek and Hebrew stuff, you know, in my sermons, because there's so much context wrapped up in language. And, you know, we've seen time and again here how understanding how a word was used when that passage, that phrase of a letter or that, you know, uh, line in a story was originally written, how that can change what we formerly thought the word meant. And this is more than just an interesting game of, of Bible trivia, you know. Uh, oh, isn't that interesting? When we look back through history, sadly, wars have been fought. Whole groups of people have been oppressed and enslaved. Other groups of people have been mocked, belittled, and marginalized because sacred ancient texts have been taken out of context. Without that, we, we risk misinterpreting a lot written in the Bible because we're removed from when it was written by thousands of years. And therefore, what we think it says on the surface is not always necessarily what it said in the beginning. 
But understanding that with God's help helps clarify its meaning. And boy, is that true about our gospel reading today from St. John's Gospel. When we understand the bigger picture, it just brings it alive for us. See, scholars have been studying this gospel, the ancient manuscripts of it, you know, the old codex copies that they dig out of the ground and the like. They've been studying them in other documents that were written at the same time for years. And many have come to a carefully developed consensus that this gospel was written about 100 years after Jesus was born give or take a few, you know, uh, to a group of Jewish Christians who were being asked to leave their local Jewish synagogue. This was happening a lot at the time, so it's no surprise. But but someone in honor of the great apostle St. John wrote this gospel to encourage this group of Christians whose belief that Jesus was God had become incompatible with the beliefs of other members of their synagogue. And this was causing great conflict and distress. Now these these Christians were confused. They were scared. Some were angry. And they felt betrayed by their synagogue leadership. And some probably wondered why the living Christ's miraculous power wasn't working to change the hearts of their fellow members, the the Jews who were asking them to leave. You see, one of the, the sources of the author of the Gospel of John, one of the sources he used, uh, he actually talks about in verse 30 of our passage today. You know, St. Paul and, and other authors of the Bible, they use sources and sometimes they'll mention their name and it's really cool because we get a glimpse of, of what they were actually looking at sitting beside them on the desk while they were writing this inspired text. And, and we see in verse 30, uh, the author of this gospel says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. So, this is what was going on. As this group of early Jewish Christians were being asked to leave their spiritual home, their synagogue, in which many might have been raised, some probably wondered, where is the power of Jesus. These miracles that we heard about, that that healed the sick, that calmed the stormy sea, and gave sight to the blind. Where is the power that drove out unclean spirits and that raised Lazarus from the dead? They felt, quite frankly, that they had failed. They didn't see Jesus' power working to change that. So some began to doubt that the living Christ was with them at all. Some, perhaps, began to ask, did he even rise from the dead? And as is the case, when there was a problem, that's when so many of our scriptures were written. And sure enough, in response, there's a problem here. So the author of the Gospel of John put pen to paper and wrote this gospel, which quotes Jesus repeating time and again after he performs miracles, that one shouldn't have to see God ministering a certain way, miraculously, in order to believe. In frustration, Jesus says on one occasion in chapter 4, Will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs? And wonders. Now these events from our Lord's life were put in this gospel because of what these Christians were experiencing at the time. It spoke right to their situation. And this theme throughout the gospel of not needing to see God minister in a certain way, do great miracles in front of you, it comes to a head in our passage today. When Thomas one of Jesus' closest followers. He doubts that Jesus has risen from the dead. 
Sound familiar? Like those Jewish Christians, he doubts that Jesus is risen from the dead, declaring in verse 25, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and I put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, then I'm not going to believe. Uh, this word he uses, this Greek word idon, that's translated as see in our passage, it, it meant more than to just see something with your eyes. It, it meant to experience something. It meant to understand something because you've had a, a big experience of it. So, so like those early Jewish Christians who were being expelled from their local synagogue, Thomas here too, he wants to experience Christ's miraculous presence in a certain way if he is to believe. You know, Jesus in his mind needed the ante up. You know, he needed to show him a miracle if he was going to believe. Well, in the story, Thomas receives what he demands. Jesus appears to him, and Thomas believes. But then what does Jesus say in verse 29? He says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Imagine what that felt like to those Christians in that synagogue to whom this gospel was written. It was teaching them a powerful message. Sometimes God's presence looks miraculous. Sometimes God will calm the stormy sea. Sometimes God will heal the sick. But other times, God's presence looks just the opposite. In fact, it can even look in the moment like failure. Like, for instance, God himself, Savior of the world, being nailed to a cross looks at first glance like failure. Like a group of faithful Jewish Christians filled with God's Spirit who had already sacrificed so much being forced out of their spiritual home. That looks at first glance like a failure. But our passage today was written to assure those Christians that even though it might not look like it at the moment, the living Christ was there with his nail and pale hands outstretched, ready to embrace them. Christ's crucifixion wasn't a failure, for it gave birth to the hope of new life in him. And those Christians' exile from their synagogue wasn't a failure either, but rather a prelude to the formation of what we call today the church as a community in its own right, a community that would spread throughout the world into many different cultures, uh, to new lands, so that the Jewish members of those synagogues could continue to be faithful to their beliefs, and these Christians could receive the freedom to be faithful to their beliefs as well. The seeming failure of exile was in reality the hope and the freedom of a new beginning. Jesus was there all along. And that's what those Christians needed to know. And the same is true for us today. Sometimes we feel like we failed. But whatever has happened, we don't need to doubt our faith. It, it's not necessary because Christ is right there with us ready to help us if we allow him to, to learn whatever we can and embrace what God has planned for us next. For every one of us who has been left in life at some point asking, God, where are you? Just like those early Christians in that community. God, where are you? To every one of us, Jesus says to us today in this gospel, just as he said to them back then, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. May God bless us as we embrace our living Savior when he works in miraculous ways, in whatever way he works. Amen.